You're Locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 558 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. Just want to thank you guys for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. That song you're hearing right now is, of course, Leave the Lights On from our good friends in Pacifier. You can check those guys out anywhere you get your music. And today, special uh, two-parter, part two of a two-parter, rather, we are going to be taking a look at the eight non-playoff teams in the Western Conference and attempting to find a trade target from all eight of those teams that the Rangers could and in many cases should be interested in. And again, this is part two of a two-parter. We covered the eight non-playoff Eastern Conference teams in an episode last week. It should be pretty easy to find. It's going to have a very similar episode title as this one has. If you see an episode that has the title that starts Trade Talk with a couple of exclamation points, uh, that's your episode. That's uh, the episode in which we cover the Eastern Conference teams. And like I said, we're going to cover the Western Conference teams right here, right now. Doesn't really matter which episode you listen to first, but I definitely recommend checking out the Eastern Conference episode as well. All right, so some breaking news here, as fate would have it, just after I got done recording this episode and you know getting ready to set it to publish uh, at midnight tonight and uh, you know go live for you guys then, breaking news that the Rangers have announced that they have indeed struck a trade with the Florida Panthers of all teams. The Rangers trade a fourth-round draft pick from next year's class to the Florida Panthers in exchange for Frank Vetrano. Vetrano, I think, mainly plays left wing, although I know he can play either wing, and I, I believe there was at least one one website, excuse me, uh, that I was looking at where he was even listed as a center in addition to all that. So it sounds like he's got versatility. He's got some speed. He's a good young player. I mean, not that young. He's 28 years old, but uh, I like this pickup. You know, again, we will talk about this in much greater detail in a future episode, but for right now, I'll just say that, you know, this is kind of what we were looking for. It's somebody that can play right wing. It's somebody that can step into a middle six role. And I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Vetrano at least get an opportunity on the Panarin line. You know, put him out there with Artemi Panarin and Ryan Strom on the second line in this upcoming game against the New York Islanders. Very, very curious to see what he can do. He's an absolute sniper. And one other thing that I'll mention real quick here, and again, we will cover Vetrano in a future episode. Maybe we'll bring in Armando Velez from Locked on Panthers and talk to him and figure out exactly, uh, you know, who we're getting here. Because obviously he's seen a lot of uh, a lot of Vetrano this season and in seasons past as well. Uh, but the one thing that I love is that if he does indeed play on the Panarin line, I've been talking on here quite a bit about how much I would love to see the Rangers uh, add a true bonafide sniper uh, in a trade and then put him out there with Strom and Panarin because Panarin and Strom, uh, two of the best passers on the Rangers. And, you know, you could even throw Adam Fox into that as well because Fox is out there for half the game anyway. But you play on a line with Panarin and Strom and, you know, Fox is going to be on the ice from time to time when Vitrano's out there as well if, if he plays on the second line. I mean, imagine some of the looks he's going to get. Imagine some of the one-timer opportunities he's going to be given just by way of playing with these guys. I mean, they're excellent passers, and I think they'll put it right on a tee for him. And as I said, I really like this trade for the Rangers. Uh, but like I said, you know, we're just scratching the surface of Vitrano, and I uh, just want to at least make mention of this, uh, put this into the episode during the, uh, you know, the editing phase of um, this episode. So, uh, yeah, th those are my quick thoughts on Frank Vitrano. And like I said, we will break it down further in a farther episode for sure. And I figure we really might as well just dive right into it here. We will start with the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, they are 20, 36, and 4. Uh, but actually, let me just back up for a second. I wanted to mention the fact that I consider the eight non-playoff teams in the Western Conference right now to be the Kraken, Coyotes, Blackhawks, Sharks, Ducks, Jets, Canucks, and Knights. And I realize the Knights are technically in the final playoff spot right now, but the Stars are only one point behind the Knights, and the Stars have four games in hand on the Knights. So I got to figure that the Stars have the inside track there. I mean, we'll see how it shakes out down the stretch, but as things stand right now, I have to put the Stars ahead of the Knights as far as that last playoff spot uh, is concerned. So those are the teams we're going to be talking about, and once again, we will start with the Arizona Coyotes. They are 20, 36, and 4. You know, I will say the Coyotes, it's a team that, you know, they never really seem to know what they're doing, and then, you know, they, they've made a lot of questionable decisions over the years. 
but they've done a really nice job of stockpiling some draft picks. They have three first rounders next year and five second rounders next year. So they are absolutely loaded as far as this upcoming draft class is concerned. As far as the player that I think should be targeted by the Rangers, I'm going to stick with Phil Kessel. It's kind of the standard answer and maybe even kind of the boring answer at this point, but I think it's also the correct one. I know there's some love for Jacob Chikrin. I wouldn't sell the farm to bring in Chikrin. I mean, he's a decent defenseman, but he's also making a decent amount of money. And I think the Rangers are best served uh, spending that money in other places, especially when you consider the Rangers have so many good young defensemen and almost all of them are locked up fairly long term. So you combine that with the fact that Chikrin is now injured and he's got to be out for two to four weeks. Uh, yeah, I'm going with Kessel. Kessel's 34 years old and impending unrestricted free agent. He has played 60 games this season, scored six goals, dished out 31 assists. It's not a staggering amount, but it's more than the Rangers have been getting from guys like Julian Gauthier or Philip Hedl. And I know Hedl's played a little bit better recently, but I do still think the Rangers need to fortify that third line. Additionally, Kessel is a right winger, and I think he would step right onto the Panarin line if the Rangers were to acquire him. And when Kako comes back, you know, maybe Kessel then slides down to the third line, or maybe Kako goes to the third line. You know, you bring him back slow and try to spread out the scoring a little bit. Uh, I've been lukewarm at best on Kessel. He still isn't my favorite trade target of all the players that we talked about in our last episode and all the players that we're going to talk about in today's episode as well. But uh, one thing you got to say about Kessel, I think he would immediately make this Ranger team better. We've talked about how they need some secondary scoring. We've talked about how they're paper thin at right wing. Uh, this is two birds with one stone. So I see no reason not to bring, it in, bring him in. Excuse me. And on top of that, it sounds like the Coyotes... I do remember seeing a report not that long ago that they would be willing to trade Phil Kessel in exchange for just a third round draft pick. And that's not that much. Now, the Rangers don't have a third rounder, so that complicates things. But maybe there's a situation where they can get by with a fourth rounder and then a third rounder from next year, something like that, something along those lines. You'd have to get tricky. Um, you know, I don't know if I'd want to give up a second rounder for Kessel, but you could do that and then, you know, maybe get a fourth rounder back in exchange along with Kessel from the Coyotes. I mean, there's options. There, there's a way to work this out. I think Kessel is certainly going to be traded before the deadline. And, uh, you know, again, I, I just think he would uh, be a pretty solid fit for the Rangers. I, I think he, again, gives you another option at right wing and gives you some depth scoring, which is something that the Rangers certainly need. And uh, we are going to continue talking about, you know, all these non-playoff teams uh, one by one here, just go through the whole list and uh, share some trade targets with you guys. We will be doing that in just a second. But first, I just want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by betonline.net. It's that time of year again as college basketball's tournament is finally upon us. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, betonline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, just want to thank you guys for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. On Monday, March 21st at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, tune in to Locked On Fantasy Hockey's live deadline reaction show to get all the on-ice fantasy and betting analysis you need from host Steel Rodin and Flip Livingston with appearances from our roster of local team experts. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, a lot of names here that could be on the move. Uh, one of them, and I'm just going to get this out of the way right off the bat here, is Patrick Kane. Now, I've heard certain whispers every now and then that maybe the Rangers would be in play for Patrick Kane. I'll believe it when I see it. I just don't think that the Rangers would match that asking price that the Blackhawks are likely to have. And, you know, Kane is not in a walk year or anything like that, so it's not like they have to trade him. He's won three Stanley Cups there. Uh, he's got a full no-move clause on top of everything that I just mentioned. And I also will say this about Patrick Kane. The Rangers, in recent seasons, have really placed an emphasis on having character players in the locker room. And without getting into too much detail here, we don't really have time to get into too much detail, but I don't think Patrick Kane really fits that description. It is tempting. Uh, he's obviously an unbelievable talent, and talk about playoff battle tested, but it goes against the manner in which the Rangers have built this team. A reunion with Artemi Panarin does sound like fun, but 
I just don't see the Rangers doing this uh, for the character concerns, but even more so the enormous asking price that the Blackhawks would undoubtedly have for, you know, a future Hall of Famer here. But in addition to Patrick Kane, I mean, there's names like Dylan Strom, Brandon Hagel, uh, Calvin DeHaan, Marc-Andre Fleury. All these guys could very well be on the move. I'm going to go a little bit against the grain here. And, you know, in our last episode where we covered the Eastern Conference teams, we didn't have any goalies. Spoiler, this is going to be the only goalie that I include on today's list. Um, you know, Calvin DeHaan is somebody that would be tempting as like a depth defenseman. I get that. But I'm going to go with Mark andre Fleury. And I don't know how realistic this is, but when you consider the fact that, you know, the Rangers, they're always rumored, this has been going on for like a year and a half at least, they're always rumored to possibly be looking to trade Alex Georgiev. And I think it very well could happen before uh, this Monday's deadline. If it does happen, you know, the Rangers could roll with Keith Kincaid as their backup. But, you know, with Igor Shesterkin having had a lot of, not a lot, but at least a decent amount of injuries since coming into the league, what better way to fortify your backup goalie situation than to bring in Marc-Andre Fleury, a multiple-time Stanley Cup champion and somebody that has been a goalie for two different teams in the Stanley Cup Finals, that, of course, being the Penguins and the Knights. Now, the one thing that I think prevents this from happening is that the Rangers are probably not going to offer a whole lot for Marc-Andre Fleury when they've got Igor Shesterkin. I mean, I think that is pretty much obvious. And I think there are teams out there that if they were looking to trade for Marc-Andre Fleury, they would want to bring him in as their starting goalie for the playoffs. I'm talking about teams like, you know, certainly the Edmonton Oilers spring to mind, uh, maybe the Leafs, maybe the Capitals. I mean, I would have to look at all their goaltender uh, stats to know for sure, but you got to figure that teams looking to bring in Fleury as a starting goalie for the playoffs are certainly going to be willing to offer more than the Rangers would be to bring him in as a backup. But again, you know, I want to include at least one goalie on this list. And, uh, you know, we got to go off the wall at least a little bit. It's very easy to just, you know, go with the uh, the names that you hear over and over again, like Phil Kessel, who we just talked about. Um, but wanted to shake it up at least a little bit. Marc-Andre Fleury, I would love him as some Igor Shesterkin insurance uh, come playoff time. How likely is this to happen? Not very, but again, wanted to at least throw it out there. And uh, I just don't see the Rangers making a play for Kane. Uh, I really, really don't for all the reasons that we just discussed. Uh, moving right along here, though, we're going to cover the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, this one was pretty easy. I'm going to go big for this one. I'm going Mark Shifley, and there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, for starters, we have no idea if the Jets would even consider trading him. Shifley is under contract for the next two seasons after this season uh, at $6.125 million a pop. So the Jets certainly don't need to trade him, and if they do trade him, they have every right to ask for a pretty enormous return. And as I just alluded to, this would not be a rental player for the New York Rangers. They'd be taking on his contract. And bringing Mark Shifley would leave them really, really tight against the salary cap. And something else that it would do, it would certainly spell the end of Ryan Strom's time as a New York Ranger. Because if Shifley's under contract next season, there's no way they're resigning Ryan Strom. I don't think the Rangers would trade Strom, even if they did bring in Mark Shifley. But they would absolutely let him walk in free agency after the season. But again, this is one of the few non-rental players where... And really just the few players in the league as far as potential trade targets where if I'm the Ranger GM, I would actually, you know, kind of back up the truck in Winnipeg and basically just say, what do you need? I mean, Mark Shifley is a heck of a player. And obviously, you got to keep it within reason. But again, if you're going to pick up a player of this caliber who is under contract for a very reasonable price for the next two seasons, then it's going to take a lot to make a trade like this happen. And, you know, I could come on here for this episode, take a look at the Jets and say, oh, hey, you know, let's trade for Paul Stasny or Andrew Kopp. You know, both of those guys are unrestricted free agents. They would both cost quite a bit less than Mark Shifley. And look, if the Rangers want to go down that road, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, both Stasny and Kopp, once again, are unrestricted free agents. But by that same token, we got to go big on here for at least one or two of our prospective trade targets. Uh, I do think it might be a little bit of a stretch thinking that the Jets would trade him at all and or that the Rangers would trade away whatever it would cost to acquire Shifley. But it's fun to think about. I mean, imagine Mark Shifley on that second line. You probably put him at center. Maybe Strom moves over to right wing. And now you've got Shifley centering Panarin and Strom. Yeah, that could be a lot of fun. Uh, but this guy's a beast. You know, this season, uh, 55 games, 23 goals, 30 assists. Uh, he's a minus 17, which is a little surprising. But, I mean, this guy's been a beast for his entire career. Still just 29 years old. Six foot three, 207 pounds. Plays with an edge. So, again, as it pertains to the Jets, Mark Shifley is my guy. Like I said, we got to aim high for at least one or two of our trade targets on here. I'm not just going to look at depth pieces 
exclusively. A lot of these guys are depth pieces, but Mark Shifley, if you want to make a splash, if you want to see the Rangers truly go for it this year, then uh, he's the guy. Back up the truck and, and see what the Jets need and see if he can't get the ball rolling a little bit. Doesn't seem very likely, but certainly fun to think about. And again, if you really, truly want to go for it, uh, I think Mark Shifley is somebody that you should be targeting. On to the Seattle Kraken. And with them, you know, I thought about Mark Giordano. He's somebody that seems all but certain to be dealt. I mean, he's a veteran defenseman. This is an expansion team. And so uh, you got to figure the Kraken will deal him and just take whatever they can get for him. But with Giordano, I'm just not that sure that he really makes the Rangers significantly better. I mean, is he a truly dramatic upgrade on Patrick Nemeth and or Zach Jones? I'm not totally convinced that he is at this point in his career. And I tend to prefer the Rangers getting a right wing or a center in general. So... We're going to aim for somebody who can play both of those positions as well as left wing, and that's going to be Callie Yarncroft. He, like a lot of guys on this list, is an impending unrestricted free agent. He is 30 years old, skated in 49 games so far this season, 12 goals and 14 assists. Those are textbook numbers for a third line type. I think bringing him in would immediately improve the Ranger third line, which is something that we've talked about needs to be a priority as the Rangers approach the deadline here. And, you know, Yarncrook pretty consistently scores at that rate throughout his whole career. If you look at his numbers, very little changes from year to year. He's a very consistent, if unspectacular, player. Uh, of course, obviously, he was in Nashville for his whole career before ending up in Seattle this year. But I got to figure the Kraken would certainly look to move him in a trade. Um, you know, they're... They got to try to get younger and try to move away some of these veterans that they got in the expansion draft. And uh, I think Yarn Crook is certainly somebody that could fit that description. And again, it's a good target for the Rangers. Third line gets an immediate upgrade. And get used to me saying this in this episode, but I think if the Rangers were to trade for Cali Yarn Crook, he could once again be a candidate to step into the second line right wing spot with Panarin and Strom. Once again, at least until Capo Caco gets back to the lineup. And if you'll permit me to do an honorable mention, can I throw out Colin Blackwell? Again, I think the Rangers should probably aim a little bit higher than somebody like Colin Blackwell, but he's an impending UFA. The Kraken took him from the Rangers in the expansion draft pretty much because there was nobody else for them to take. Uh, and if you're of the belief that the Rangers should not yet be going all in and you want to do some shopping at the bargain bin, I think Colin Blackwell makes some sense. He plays right wing and center. Once again, those are the two positions where the Rangers need the most help in my very humble opinion, at least. And if they picked him up, you know, he might once again step into that second line right wing spot. He played with Panarin and Strom a little bit uh, the season that he was here. And with Blackwell, there could be a wide range of outcomes. He could end up on the third line. He could even be a healthy scratch on certain nights. Uh, but I want to at least toss out the idea of a reunion. Again, I think the Rangers should aim a little bit higher. But if they get outbid on the big time trade targets and they just want to pick up somebody who will cost very little, I mean, Colin Blackwell might be uh, worth at least some consideration there. Blackwell missed some time earlier in the season and got off to a slow start with the Kraken, but he is up to being close to a half point per game player. He's caught fire a little bit recently. He only does have eight goals and eight assists for a total of 16 points in 37 games. So not stellar numbers, but once again, if you're just looking for uh, somebody who's very much a depth piece and you're not looking for the Rangers to go crazy at the deadline this season, then again, honorable mention to Colin Blackwell. And we'll continue talking about the four remaining teams in just a second. Moving right along to the San Jose Sharks. This is another pretty easy one for me. I look at, you know, their depth chart or whatever you want to call it. You know, I'm on cap friendly and looking at everybody's contract situation and who's an unrestricted free agent, and who's a restricted free agent, and, you know, who could be a buy low candidate, all that good stuff. But to me, I look at this, you know, chart here. Give me Tomas Hurdle. I know the Sharks are still hopeful to extend him, but if they can't, this is a prime target for the Rangers. He would just be a rental since he's an unrestricted free agent after the season. And actually, as a quick aside, let me just say, all these players that are impending unrestricted free agents that we've mentioned both today and in our Eastern Conference episode, I don't want to make it sound like it's 100% a slam dunk that they would only be rentals with the Rangers. That's what seems most likely. But if there's a situation where, you know, the Rangers trade for Tomas Hurdle and next season rolls around and Ryan Strom and the Rangers can't come to an agreement and Strom walks in free agency, then, I mean, I guess it's possible that the Rangers could bring back Tomas Hurdle or any other impending unrestricted free agent that they bring in. Again, it does not seem likely, especially not with Hurdle, because I think he's going to get a little bit of a pay bump. Um, but... You know, it's at least possible that one of these rentals turns out to be somebody who stays with the Rangers longer than we're anticipating. I don't think it would happen with Hurdle. Even getting Hurdle in general is going to be tough because there's going to be a lot of teams bidding for his services, including the Sharks, who would like to uh, hang on to him. Uh, but, you know, Hurdle, 
if the Rangers were to acquire him, somebody who would fit like a glove in a middle six role. He can beef up the second power play unit as well, which, I mean, the Rangers' second power play, I don't think they've scored more than three or four goals all season, so he could help there. Uh, he can play center and left wing. I'm not sure if he plays right wing all that often. He could probably handle it in a pinch. Uh, but, you know, you could have a second line of Hurdle centering Panarin on the left and Ryan Strom on the right. And Hurdle's a really good face-off guy. And if you guys have listened to this podcast for any amount of time, you know that I'm big on face-offs, especially come playoff time. And uh, Hurdle, for the past three seasons, has a success rate of 54% or better in the face-off circle. And for his career, he's sitting at 53.1%. So those are obviously uh, solid numbers on the dot. And, uh, you know, just a good all-around game. Good all-around two-way forward and somebody that I would welcome with open arms to the Rangers. Uh, we'll see if they can pull it off. Like I said, he will have no shortage of suitors, but this is somebody that would obviously give the Rangers a big boost come playoff time. On to the Anaheim Ducks, and I hope you guys were doing some scouting the other night because, you know, this is a team that certainly looks like it will be full-fledged sellers. I think they pretty much uh, made that official when they traded Manson to the Avalanche. So again, certainly looking like they are open for business and looking to be sellers. Uh, Ducks are in kind of a weird spot because I feel like they haven't really gone full-fledged rebuild quite yet. There are some exciting young players like Zegris and Terry, but then you've got a good amount of vets and, you know, they've got nine impending unrestricted free agents. So uh, maybe this will be the trade deadline that really kicks off their rebuild. They'll just trade these guys left and right. But there are two names that really stand out for me when it comes to the Ducks. And we talked about both of them uh, with J.D. Hernandez, the host of Locked on Ducks, with whom we did a crossover episode. And those two players, for me at least, looking at the Ducks roster, Ricard Raquel and Hampus Lindholm. Both are impending unrestricted free agents. I've talked about how the Rangers' top priority should probably be right wing and then center and then defensive. But with that said, going to go a little bit against the grain here and implore the Rangers to, you know, if they're going to make a deal with the Ducks, go after Hampus Lindholm. This guy is a rock-solid defenseman, and I do think he's enough of an upgrade on Patrick Nemeth to make this deal worth it. I've been saying all along that I am not interested on a slight marginal upgrade on Patrick Nemeth because what's the point? Why even trade away draft picks and or prospects just to get slightly, slightly better at your sixth defenseman spot, especially when Zach Jones is still there. He's an option to take over Nemeth outright, and he's already in-house. Uh, so I wouldn't be a fan of the Rangers, you know, doing a lot to just, or giving away a lot rather, to just bring in somebody that is a slight upgrade on Nemeth. But Lindholm is really good. And if the Rangers can have Lindholm and potentially even trade Patrick Nemeth to Anaheim as part of the trade in a way to dump his salary, I'm all for it. That might be easier said than done because I just don't know how much interest a team like Anaheim would have in somebody like Patrick Nemeth. They're sort of kind of rebuilding over there. So if they were to take on Nemeth in a trade with the Rangers, they might immediately look to flip him somewhere else or flip him in the offseason. That's certainly possible. Uh, but again, getting back to Lindholm here, there's a top pair quality defenseman who on the Rangers would probably be on the third pairing. I mean, maybe you could put him on the second pairing with Truba and drop Miller down to the third pairing, but you guys have seen Ke'Andre Miller recently. He's been awesome. So uh, you could have a, once again, top pair quality defenseman playing on your third pairing. That's quite the luxury for the Rangers. Uh, Lindholm has spent his whole career with the Ducks. 61 games this season, five goals, 17 assists. He is an even plus minus. He's been averaging 22 minutes and 32 seconds of time on the ice. Six foot four, 216 pounds, so that bodes well for playoff hockey as well. The Ducks apparently would like to re-sign him, but that has not happened yet. And if it doesn't happen, then he's my top choice from the Ducks. And maybe Ricard Raquel might be a little bit more realistic because he's kind of a third-line type player, and that's kind of what the Rangers need. But I wanted to mix in at least one or two defensemen on today's list, and I just really like Lindholm. So he's my pick, and we'll move right along to the Canucks here. For the Canucks, I really hate to say this, but I don't think that we're going to get our reunion with JT Miller. And there might be some Ranger fans who are happy about that. They just don't think that he'd be worth, uh, you know, whatever the Rangers would have to give up to get him. Uh, Miller does have another year on his contract after this season. The Canucks have six impending unrestricted free agents. They can deal any of those. And for both of those reasons, they really don't have to trade JT Miller. And on top of that, they're still somewhat in the playoff chase, and even if they don't make it this year, they probably feel that they can be a playoff team as soon as next season. Miller would still be there, and uh, you know who knows? Maybe the Canucks themselves are hoping to do uh, a long-term deal of some kind with JT Miller before he's an unrestricted free agent once again after next season. 
with all that said, I'm still going to say JT Miller is the guy if the Rangers end up doing a deal with Vancouver, partially because there just isn't really that much else there as far as uh, realistic trade candidates and or players that you would actually want the Rangers to get. I mean, there's some UFAs. I mean, Tyler Mott, okay, Alex Chason, uh, Nicholas Peaton, and Brad Hunt. I mean, are any of these guys better than any of the guys that are currently on the Rangers? With JT Miller, you know, a reunion is always fun. He's been an outstanding player over the past three seasons here. You would be getting someone who's been a point-per-game player during that time or right on the uh, precipice of being a point-per-game player. Uh, plays a very physical game as well, not afraid to go to the dirty parts of the rink. I think he would be an excellent fit on the second line right wing spot with Panarin and Strom. Like I said, I was going to be saying that a lot today, but that's the kind of player that I think the Rangers should target. Somebody who could either play there or, once again, fortify the third line. And I think the Ranger fans would welcome him back, and I think they'd be very excited for that. But if they do go down that road, then I think Miller is certainly someone to target. Again, I just don't think the Rangers are going to meet the astronomical asking price that the Canucks seem to have for JT Miller. I don't even think Miller gets traded, period. Uh, but there isn't really anyone else on this roster that looks like a good fit as far as the Canucks are concerned. So we will once again aim high and go with JT Miller as it pertains to the Canucks. He's my top target. Uh, once again, his arrival could very well spell the end of Ryan Strom's time with the Rangers since Miller is under contract for next season. But, you know, as we talk about this, some of that's on Strom because it sounds like the Rangers and Strom have been negotiating on and off all season. And, uh, you know, they've been talking about the potential of a new deal, but there still is not a new deal. So Strom can fix all of that if he really wants to be a Ranger badly enough simply by signing the dyed line. Uh, by that same token, if Strom thinks he's worth more than the Rangers are offering and he wants to test free agency, then I get that too. I, I have nothing against Strom for wanting to do that. But, you know, with his future uncertain... I don't see how he can get upset at the Rangers if they bring in somebody that turns out to be his replacement, like I think JT Miller would be. Uh, but yeah, you know what? As far as the Canucks, once again, give me a Ranger reunion with JT Miller. That would be a lot of fun, and uh, he would obviously play a huge, huge role for this team down the stretch and, of course, into the playoffs. And lastly, we come to the Vegas Golden Knights, and this is kind of a weird one because unlike most of the teams on this list and on our Eastern Conference list that we did last week, uh, the Knights are not going to sell. I, I don't care how badly they've played recently. They're not going to hit the panic button and start shipping out players left and right between now and Monday afternoon, which is when the trade deadline will occur. So it's not all that easy to come up with a deal here. Uh, on top of that, they've only got two impending UFAs on the active roster. And overall, I think impending UFAs are what the Rangers should be targeting. Those two Unrestricted free agents are Riley Smith and Matthias Yanmark, and I'm going to go with Riley Smith. It's a name that's been mentioned in trade talks. We've talked about him a little bit on here on this podcast. Uh, it certainly seems like he's somebody that could be on the move, although it's not a guarantee because part of the reason why the Knights were looking to, or at least considering moving Smith, was because of salary cap concerns. But with Mark Stone now on the long-term injured reserve, my understanding is that he does not count against their salary cap, and so they don't really need to trade Riley but I still think they could. Again, an impending unrestricted free agent, they seemingly have no chance of re-signing him, and I think you could maybe get him for a second-round pick, and I think I would do that if I was the Rangers. I think I'd give up one of the two second-rounders to bring in Riley Smith, once again, somebody that could maybe play on the second line, and in a absolute worst-case scenario, would make the third line a heck of a lot better. He'd probably be the best player, or at least the biggest scoring threat on the Ranger third line if they were to bring him in. So a second-rounder for Smith is something that I would do, and again, he checks a couple of boxes here. Primarily a right winger, which is where the Rangers need the most help, and he gives you some secondary scoring. Solid season so far for Smith. He's got 16 goals and 22 assists for a total of 38 points in 56 games. Again, it's not a stellar amount, but that is like textbook third line secondary scoring, which again, that's my biggest priority if I'm the GM of the New York Rangers. So uh, that'll pretty much do it for today. I gotta say, we aim pretty high. I, I set the bar pretty high as far as some of these trade targets are concerned, some big names on this list. I think I was a little bit conservative with the Eastern Conference, but I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the Rangers are gonna do. You could make a case for a lot of different players, a lot of different approaches, and uh, I'm just ready to sit back and watch the madness. I'm a little nervous, like a lot of Ranger fans I'm sure certainly are, but I think Drury mostly knows what he's doing. Most 
obviously has made good moves since he's been the Ranger GM, and I think this will be more of the same, uh, you know, leading into the trade deadline here. Uh, but that will pretty much do it for today, guys. Once again, if you'd like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. And definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time. Thanks for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. In our next episode, we're going to be teaming up with Gil Martin for a special post-game edition after the Rangers play the Islanders. Now make your second listen, Locked On Fantasy Hockey. Host Steel Rodine and Flip Livingston help you become the expert of your fantasy league. It is free and available wherever you get your podcasts.